Great, so we are back for the second part of today. And uh, I'm really happy now to introduce uh, the keynote, Racial Discrimination in the Age of AI. And uh, close to me, we have the wonderful <laughs> Rihanna Ailube that is going to moderate uh, our keynote speaker. So I wanted to introduce uh, her properly and then you can introduce uh, Mutale. So Rihanna is a writer, host and curator from London. She moved uh, to Berlin in 2018, where she was a resident curator of Becker Shanti Cafe and Wedding. And you did very interesting events there, a lot also about the discourse of discrimination and uh, right-wing extremism. So I think that uh, you, know, you also sh should check out this space because you do very interesting things. And um, Rihanna is uh, hosting the No Small Talk Party um, and also curated uh, the series uh, Afropian Identity um, and at the same time co-hosted the podcast uh, uh, Tanti Table, interviewing people that uh, are experiencing diaspora uh, in Germany, so people that uh, are part of these communities. And uh, she holds a double first class degree from Cambridge University in politics, psychology, and sociology. So I leave now the word to you. <laughs> Very happy to have you here. And uh, yeah, good luck with this great keynote. Is this? Yes, cool. Hi, welcome. Um, thank you as well, Tatiana and the whole team for inviting me to moderate this, um, this keynote. I'm so excited to introduce our next speaker. Um, Matale Nkonde is a US-based policy analyst and a 2018 to 19 fellow at Data and Society Research Institute in New York City. Um, she works on the intersection of race, technology, and policy. She's been working as a senior tech policy advisor for Congresswoman Yvette Cooper Clark since 2016. And she was part of the team that helped to bring in, um, introduce the algorithmic Accountability Act into the House of Representatives just this year in April 2019. And she's currently also introducing other data privacy, data privacy proposals, including I think one this week, um, of surrounding deep fakes and everything that's happening surrounding this. She is also the founder of the Dorothy Vaughan Tech Symposium, a briefing series that takes place on Capitol Hill. And her work has been covered in MIT Tech Review. She's an author on a really interesting report about racial literacy and tech. And she speaks widely on race, policy, and AI. And super excitingly, she's, um, she can announce now that she has been announced as a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard to start later on this year. Um, so we're really happy to have you um, and to hear your talk about diversity, um, the future of AI and civil rights. And yeah, we just welcome you to the stage now. Thank you. Good afternoon. Okay, I hope this works. So as you heard, my name is Mitali Conde. I am based in the US, but I actually grew up in the UK, which I always think is really ironic that one of the first advisors to Capitol Hill is from the UK, but that's a different thing we can speak about after drinks. So one of the first things that I point out when people, think, when people ask me how I got into technology was in the United States, tech is white, it's male, and it's extremely elitist. So when I saw this image in 2015 of then President Obama leaning over a computer, um, really looking at code, as you can see on the laptop, I thought that this is potentially a place for me. Because up until that time, there had been no specific discourse around what it would mean to be to be black in technology. And I found out that you could be black and in technology if you didn't say anything about it, which was great for some people, but not me, so here we are. The irony of speaking about race and technology is race and technology have been intri intricately linked since the dawning of popular computing. 
I'm always told, don't put too many words on a slide, so I always put too many words on slides, hello slide. But I, I really um, put this together to give a timeline of the erasure of black women in technological spaces in the United States. So the first person to actually introduce what we now know as programming was a woman called Dorothy Vaughn. And for anybody that's seen the Hollywood figure, um, the Hollywood movie Hidden Figures, they'll know that she is the character that has to steal a book from a white library because it was during the time of segregation to learn how to save her job. So computing was originally done by, by people, and thanks to this black woman in the 1960s, she transferred her team, her black team, into the IBM suite so that they could then go and program the computers involved in the moon landing. 1997, so we're almost 40 years ahead, Dr. Lat Latanya Sweeney, who's at the Kennedy School of Government, does an open data search to look at how secure private records are. And what she finds is that she can use open source data to find the health records of the then governor of Massachusetts. This leads to what we call the US HIPAA laws, which basically say that we have privacy over our, medical over our medical intervention, but the fact that she's black is never mentioned. Go forward to 2013, the city of Los Angeles launched a civil rights complaint against their State Department of Justice because a programmer finds that in, in code, in the language that, in code language, the terms master and slave are used as, uh, as computer components. Setting up the power imbalance of what we're already seeing in technology, but remember, race is something that cannot be named, but is always present. We go forward to 2017 to the AI Futures Act, which is introduced to the House of Representatives. And it's the first time the term artificial intelligence is introduced into that chamber. Now the irony of this, and this is something that I can certainly discuss later, was that the term AI was coined in the 50s, but it took the United States, the most powerful country in the world, to take almost 60 years to think about how we're going to deal with, the, with AI. And one of the people on that team is a black woman. And then in 2019, myself with two co-authors, sociologist Jesse Daniels, um, author of the book Cyber Racism, one of the first researchers in the US to look at white supremacy online, myself and computer scientist Dirk Schock Mir start what is an ongoing pro pro project called late Racial Literacy in Tech. But you may wonder, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because as we'll discuss further, even though the mere discussion of race is taboo in technological circles in the US is ever present. So I think one of the best ways for me to think about racial literacy in terms of policy is to look at the US priorities laid out in the AI Futures Act. We are the United States, so it starts with the creation of an enabling business environment, something that I am very happy to leave to lobbyists, but I do want you to understand that these are ranked in terms of priority. So what that says to any analyst looking at this list is no matter what we do, Cash is king. The second is future of work. Now, as somebody who's interested in social justice, racial justice, and, our, and civil rights, my questions to that are future of whose work, how are we gonna work, and how are historically underrepresented, underfunded groups gonna engage in this new workforce? The third is privacy, and the fourth is bias. And bias is where the rest of this talk is really, really going to sit. Um, as you heard yesterday, in the discourse around AI, we're speaking a lot about um, ethics, which isn't necessarily something I'm going to go into. But I would suggest that like bias and like the terms diversity, these terms don't get to the heart of the problem I want to solve. So the question that I've really been concerning myself with over the last three to four years while I've been working in Congress is if we're speaking about bias, how can we speak about bias without race? So in United States civil rights legislation, what we have is 
we cannot sue somebody for racial bias unless you can prove that they are intentionally meet, meaning to discriminate. Now, all of us in this room know that race gets embedded into data sets through proxies. And so in the US, the greatest country in the world, as, as I pointed out, we have no laws to actually protect people from racialized, what are called minorities, but they're really the majority of the country. So this past year, I've been a fellow at Data and Society Research Institute in New York City. We are an independent nonprofit that looks at the techno-social implications of um, our technological futures. And while there, I've been working on the report that I referenced. We've spent eight months. We spoke to our, our data, our universe was 15 to 20 uh, people in large tech firms. The report is still ongoing, so I'm kind of being vague because I want them to be my friend. And what we did was send out an five, a, a five-point questionnaire to start a conversation about race within these companies in Silicon Valley. So we started, you know, easily. What do you think about race? Everybody thought that race was a great thing. They had all voted for Obama. They liked Michelle. All the relevant things that were not asked, but we got those responses anyway. And as the questions went down, we started to ask them, how do you feel about terms like Black Lives Matter? What do you think the structural components are of race? Because unlike Michael Jackson, I actually do believe that it does matter if you're black or white, or at least it does in the American context. Being black in the US means that you are likely to have, your mother is likely to have poor prenatal care, more likely to die in childbirth. If you do survive, you will be placed in um, less favorable housing conditions. Your schools are gonna be less equipped to teach you and the criminalization of black communities through surveillance technologies means that you are more likely to be incarcerated or free. So many of these responses were extremely worrying to me and extremely worrying to me as a sociologist because the term that kept coming up in our responses was this notion of color blindness. I don't see race. The reason that's problematic and the reason that I would like to problematize it in the context of technology and AI is that we do have the social science to prove that all color blindness does is absolve the people who, who hold to that theme for doing anything about it. And we see this in the recruitment numbers of places like uh, Facebook and Google. I recently, for another project, went through, I was curious to see who is really doing R&D around artificial intelligence in the United States. And I found that in Google's facial intelligence team, out of 893 people, one of the women on the Google Brain project is black. One, one out of 893, and she's an intern, which means at the end of next academic year, she'll cycle out. When I looked at Facebook, when I looked at Facebook for a comparator, 164 researchers work in what they identify as their AI research team, and none of those are black. So when we think about technologies being produced for a shared future, my question is whose future are we sharing? And some of the companies that we mentioned in this report, some of the, I'm sorry, some of the respondents in the report that I have behind me came from those companies. So to return to color blindness and its issues for just a small amount of time, Edward Silva Bernardo, the head of, uh, I'm sorry, Benilla, um, the head of sociology at Duke University in the United States, wrote their book, Colorblind, Colorblindness, the New Racism. And what he found was the reason that those rooms are not black, the reason that those black people are not hired is America is not re ready or willing to have a conversation about race. So we recently published three broad recommendations that would help us 
move towards what could be a much more realistic view of um, designing technologies for a country like the United States, which within 30 years is going to have more people of color who are citizens than the white population. And that's why we may be seeing this rise of the extreme right. Again, different conversation, happy to have later, but do have data. So the first thing that we said is that there has to be a commitment to talk about race, but moving away from this superficial, I like black people, I have a black friend, I voted for Obama, all of those things are nice, but they don't move power. And what I'm really interested in, and the reason I work in policy, is that I'm looking for structural ways to right-size this industry. So thinking about cognitively, having access, um, AI researchers having access to information about how the technologies they are producing and have historically produced impact um, populations of color specifically black populations for the report. The second, re the second recommendation links to what I've just said. Technology is designed for everybody, but it impacts us all differently. I'm gonna speak about a project that I'm on, a facial recognition project in New York a bit later, so I'm not gonna say too much here. But when we looked at the respondents in our report, they seem to assume that all technology helps everybody. So I had the opportunity to actually do an in-depth um, interview with one um, amazing woman, technologist. So I took her to a public bathroom and I asked her to put her hands under the soap dispenser and soap came out. I then put my hand under the soap dispenser and soap did not come out. Because the way those soap dispensers are set up is to recognize the white hand. Which means if you're a black person that goes to the bathroom, comes out, and wants to wash your hands, you have to find a white person with a spare hand with the time to dispense soap. So that is a very small example if it does not impact you. It's a very big and humiliating example if you think about the history of, of colored and white bathrooms in the United States, the memory that that invokes, and the reality that being colorblind in that instance did not serve all market segments. The third is a commitment to equity. Now, People often ask me, why am I interested in equity and not equality? And the answer is really simple. Equity is the acceptance that some communities need more resources to get to the same place. So if you are the one black woman working on the Google Brain Project, and you're dealing both the social, emotional, and psychological stress of not just working in an environment where you're the only one, but trying to engage in the work of getting your ideas out, being heard, being seen as equal as, uh, by your superior, superiors, you're gonna need different supports to get to that place. The third recommendation is probably the most controversial for the companies that I spoke to, because it speaks to long-term planning, further research, and the acceptance of changing a culture to accept the idea that some people need and should get more. If I'm going to continue to live in the United States and really buy into this idea that all people are created equal and all people have the right to happiness, these are what I would consider the very minimum that needs to take place. And this is where the research that we just published kind of uh, drops off and the second, stage be the second stage happens. Our first data set were self-selected. They considered themselves racial warriors. They considered themselves like the best people on race ever. And I'm sure we broke some hearts when we said that we all have a long way to go because what we're speaking about is sharing power and not necessarily being nice to each other. Because you can be horrible to me as long as you give me the resources to live a full and vibrant life. 
This takes me to where I am right now. So, Brownsville is a place in New York City. It's very, it's actually very close to me. I live in a low income neighborhood in a borough called Brooklyn. And the residents in Brownsville have usually a, a junior high school education. They make up to about 20 to $25,000 a year on average. And the average medium income in New York City is 89,000 just to give you an idea of that. Brownsville is the only, only neighborhood that we have in New York that is completely public housing, which means that these people cannot afford to house themselves. And we have a pri private, par pri private public partnerships where private landlords can build social housing and then put in low-income tenants. And What's happened around that is a private landlord has recently gone into a public housing complex and said that the residents will lose their homes unless they replace their keys for facial recognition technology. It's a case that's been taken up by our public defenders. Um, it's actually the it's, it's actually the district that Congresswoman Yvette Clark, um, the congressperson I work with very closely, covers. And so we've been working with a group of other stakeholders to go to New York State and say that in a situation where a public vendor is rendering public goods and services, they have to abide by civil rights legislation. However, I'm running into the problem that I laid out in the slide prior. Our civil rights law do not allow for unintended consequences. So what we did was that we decided to give these residents a crash course on AI technologies, facial recognition technologies, and then how these technologies impacted them and they're waging a war as we speak right now against New York State and New York City. Because as you can see from the picture, they know, they inherently understand and know the dangers of facial recognition technology. Beyond facial, recogni te te beyond facial recognition, they're also the most surveilled community in the United States. And it's these places that, pub that surveillance technologies in public spaces are being experimented with. When I was, when I was um, with the city speaking about this, my real curiosity was, well, why don't we have facial recognition for Trump Tower? Why don't we have facial recognition on the Upper East Side? Why don't we have facial recognition in Central Park? And the answer was clear, those people are safer, those people need less management. I was also told that apparently this population loses their keys, but they're not gonna lose their face, which, true. I mean, I don't know about the keys part, but it really, really brought me back to this idea of racial literacy and had there been somebody on the team who had the, insight and the foresight to speak about how unbelievably pervasive this is, how wrong this is, and how little resources this particular group have to fight back. They shouldn't need a congressperson and legal defenders and the press to tell their story. This just should not be done. So we're, I'm in close communication with um, our friends in San Francisco. I'm not sure if you guys in Berlin heard, but they were the first municipality to ban facial recognition in public spaces. And ironically, they, are, they sit at the feet of Silicon Valley and are the developers of these technologies they do not want deployed near their own homes. And I'm really thinking about, and, and would love in discussion, questions, whatever, really like to think about tactics where those of us who do have power, those of us that, that do have platforms, can help inform communities that may be disconnected about how they can use their own power to fight against this. So, really what, I think I'm seeing when it comes to racial literacy in technology in the United States context 
is a naivety around how the same, uh, the same desire to hold down and to mistreat one group of people can be, and can be weaponized against us. And one of the places that we saw this was actually in our last presidential election where um, special counsel Robert Mueller had indicted 13 members of the Russian Internet Institute for impersonation of black uh, groups online. And the goal was to suppress the Clinton vote by suppressing black voters because they are the major voting bloc and then create a runway for Trump. So one of the strategies, and I would love to speak to people more about this later, is creating this narrative that a lack of facial recognition undermines the national security of not just the United States, because those technologies will, that, that cultural fault line can be, it, it, it can be used to create mistrust and divisions within a society using online systems. So in the Mueller case, it was the advertising recommendation algorithms that meant anti-Clinton messages reached 1.2 million people. That could happen again. And if we keep um, instituting policies like facial recognition and public housing, you're still keeping that simmering resentment, which is gonna be on racial lines, mediated by AI technologies and making us all weaker. So that's facial recognition in tech. I thought it was 45 minutes, but I guess it's not. No, 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 I'm good. Oh it, was, oh, it was 45 minutes. Sorry, I got nervous with the last panel that I wouldn't be long enough, I wouldn't have enough slides, I wouldn't have enough English. S oh, wait, okay. Oh, wait, I have 20 minutes? Oh, wow. No, it wasn't long enough. Oh, gosh. But I can, I can actually speak off slide because this is what I do all day, every day. I thought I'd done 45 minutes. Okay. Um, I can speak about this, but I can actually go more in depth, if you wouldn't mind, into the actual survey. I was rushing because I didn't think I would have time. But one of the things that I think was so interesting in sending out these calls were our problems with race are, um, in the UK are, uh, I'm sorry, well, in the UK too, but I didn't do the survey there, but certainly in the US are so deep that my colleague, Jesse Daniels, is a white woman. Obviously, her name is Jesse, and she had to send all the emails because obviously my name is racialized. And it, it would take us up to three or four emails to really get into the conversation around race. And one of the things that we found, so we spoke to engineers, we spoke to diversity and inclusion folks, we spoke to researchers, we spoke to what felt like a ton of marketing people. But one of the things that I found were the marketing people had way better talking points about this subject than the engineers. And when we spoke to engineers, their responses were around, this is mathematical, this really doesn't have anything, to, you're making me feel uncomfortable. Um, we had a bunch where people were like, oh, it's too uncomfortable. These are white people. It's too uncomfortable to, make, to, to talk about race because I think something bad happened, but I'm not sure what it was, and now I'm really upset. And I was like, well, cry white tears. Try living in my body, right? I was just like, you are crazy. Um, but it was very telling because if I, had, if, if I had replaced the word race for trans, if I had replaced the word um, race for disabled, if I had even replaced the word race for poor, it would have been the same results. So as I think for those of us in this community who are in somewhat of an echo chamber, some of the work that, in my opinion, needs to be done is trying to figure out how do we get our community speaking to other communities who are so fragile that the mere mention of something they're not comfortable about makes them close down. And we would use all kinds of tactics. So, 
Um, Jessie isn't just white, she's like white, blonde, blue-eyed, so I would like send your picture, show them you're one of them, make them feel, uh, you know, comfortable. And that's fine for me because I sit in a research environment. This research that I did was to really complement the work I'm doing in Congress because racial, there is no racial literacy in technology, but there's actually no racial literacy in America. So I'm just taking one group of racially illiterate people and then can use this, these findings to hopefully inform practice in another area. Um, Another thing about the report that I thought was so, so, so interesting was even in the populations where they were more comfortable with race, they're actually asking us questions like, we would like to know if anybody of color, any black people are involved in this process. I would like you know, to, to be in touch with uh, that person or those people. They were extremely comfortable with me. And that's fine. I have an elite education. I have a great bio. Um, I'm introducing all the bills all the time. You know, I'm kind of a, a black shiny person. But I'm much more interested in just a general comfort and a general acceptance of the humanity of all people, including all black people. And when it got to that conversation, that's where the sticking points seeped in. And I'm especially seeing this in the Brownsville context where uh, we're, as we're having some of those discussions, it's like, well, they're not black people like you. And my response to that is they face the same level of discrimination, the same level of systematic barriers, the same level of um, difficulty navigating whichever world they're in. So not only are they just like me, but if you can successfully deploy these technologies under a public contract, which is why I so value the, the panel before us that they spoke to procurement. If you can deploy that within a public sector setting, then you are really opening the doors for people like me that live in private buildings. And worse still, many more white people live in private buildings than black people, so they're coming for you and kind of, being, finding a way of telling that story that technology, the technology migrates and it migrates due to market uh, demands and it's not a respecter of person. But if you look at the way black communities, trans communities, poor communities are being impacted by AI technologies, that could actually be a good predictor, at least in the American setting, about where we're going next with this. So anybody that has any tips around telling that story, I would be really interested in. And then the third point, when we did this report, uh, Doc Shanmir is a, com a professor of computer science at Bucknell, um, Indian woman, uh, born in India, now in America. She really brought up some really interesting points about how, how anti-blackness and how race is communicated between and amongst communities of color. So this, am this am amazed me, but I, I think that it's, in our future work, it's worth exploring. So in the United States, and it, this actually reminds me somewhat of apartheid South Africa, we have racial hierarchies where white people are on top and then any minority that can become somehow white adjacent or white friendly is ranked higher than the most. So black people right at the bottom, don't, don't kid yourself, like go and have an alternative life, which is why we have hip hop, better music, we're doing our own thing, we don't care. Um, but for Asian, specifically, um, when I say Asian, I'm thinking about it in the American context. So um, people from like China, Korea, Japan, they're very acceptable, they're exceptional, they all like math, they don't, you know, they, they study for tests, whatever. Indians come actually very um, closely underneath, and you specifically see this in Silicon Valley, and then it goes down. Blacks are at the bottom, Latinos are slightly above. And when we were speaking to Darkashan, 
she is a woman who's extremely committed to racial justice, and she's also a woman who's committed um, to, she's in part, like, in the fight with me against anti-blackness because she is a dark-skinned Indian woman. So she, her skin tone is not actually that much lighter than mine, even though I'm fully African. And when she spoke about her experience on the marriage market in terms of skin tone, she also then spoke about why it's so easy for some other people of color within these spaces that we were studying to still hold white supremacist views. So I think as we go on with this work, I'm really interested in those nuances because those stories are not necessarily told. And it's not that those groups even I could understand it more if they were like, oh my God, you're Indian, let me give you the wealth of the US nation and all the power and go off and be anti-black. But these groups themselves face extremely dire uh, racial discrimination within the valley. In fact, the first, um, one of the jokes until Google had, um, got their last CEO was that if you were Indian, you could not head a company in the valley. So I'm also interested in some of those um, cross-cultural conversations that could be had and marrying those to anti-racist white people who, in the original slide, when I thought it was too long, I wasn't gonna get to y'all, but I have not forgotten you and I appreciate you because one of the things that we found were a critical mass of anti-racist white people, those people who were truly committed to really looking at how discrimination works on a structural level. So this isn't about liking black people, being our friends and voting for Obama. This is more about being the one in the meeting to say while you're hiring, isn't it strange that we don't have these types of candidates. Being the one, if you are on the team with the lone black person in AI, somehow they end up next to you. Really making sure that that person is given a chance and those ideas are forwarded, and really being willing at times when it's appropriate to step back so that they can step forward. So this idea of equity then becomes a reality. And one of the things that I think is really interesting and really requires certainly more attention from researchers like me, but potentially other people in the room, is that I feel like that's an untapped resource. And I know that when I'm in rooms other than this, and I, um, I was, so I came here from, I live in New York. I came here from Chicago because I was at a meeting with a funder and they wanted to meet in Chicago and one of, kind of famous guy comes up to me at the end and he's like, I really love your work, what can I do? And I was saying, well, you can introduce me to your funding officer. You can not just say that you love my work, but you can quote my work and cite me. You can recommend that I am put on panels. And when people are talking about money, you can earmark it for me. And he was like, oh, I didn't mean that. And I was like, well, then you don't really like me. I have to get a flight. <laughs> like, I came here with a plan for my life. And, but it's really those very, very material things that can be done. And this does extend to white women, but this talk isn't for you. I'm sure there'll be other talks, but it extends to white women too, right? Because if we look at how they're funded, if we look at how they're promoted, that doesn't last. But those, what I call, um, I always say I don't want allies, I want accomplices, but what I call that radical solidarity that can be had if we start to have some of these conversations is extremely, extremely true. And it is gonna make you feel uncomfortable. So this same man that I was telling me to give me all the money all the time, I also said, and your company sucks, so can, you, can they stop? Um, running like it's Pride Month in the US and like all of <laughs> it's Pride Month, black, black trans women are being killed, there's no commentary. I need you because you're a white man with this positionality, with this power to say that you cannot say that you're one thing or another. And once you have said those, you have to then transfer them to power. Because if we did some of those things, 
then I wonder whether in procurement conversations it would make sense to put a facial recognition technology in a low-income housing unit. Because what that says to me from a procurement perspective is that these people do not matter. They're not gonna be able to fight back. We are gonna somehow change law because it's putting people out of their homes for not complying with a key recommendation isn't actually a thing, it turns out, in New York, but they tried it, right? And if you think about the level of intimidation, there would be people embedded in those teams that would, be, that would say, no, that's, that's actually racist, and not say some of the things that I find myself, particularly in um, introductory conversations, so diversity, which means, ethics, whose ethics, we're really gonna talk to a bunch of white philosophers to tell, I mean, no. You know, it, it, but, but be very firm. If we're speaking about racism, let's talk about racism, let's talk about the history of racism, let's look at the way that whiteness has been transformed into currency through white people being able to own homes, white people being given loans at a greater rate. And these are algorithmic decisions that are being made. White people being placed algorithmically into better schools. Let's fix the social problem that's reinforced by our technological systems. If we're speaking about gender diversity, expression, trans, let's really speak about that. Let's speak about creating a real space for those people in society. If we're speaking about poverty, let's think about what it is. Do not speak about diversity and do not speak about ethics, because when you speak about diversity writ large or ethics writ large, you're actually making a commitment to be colorblind color deaf and color dumb and my recommendation is that we move away from that how's my time oh five minutes okay I am actually gonna stop here because I don't have any more English and I'm thirsty but thank you for your time Hello. Okay, thank you so much for that amazing talk. And there's, I have so many questions to ask, but also you guys will also have a chance to definitely ask your questions, so just get thinking. Um, something that interests me a lot is the kind of conversations that we don't get to hear. And I would like to hear a bit more about the groups of people organizing for on this facial recognition um, scandal and what happened and in particular what were people most afraid of was it because I read some of the articles surrounding it and was it I might be locked out of my house because these facial recognitions don't seem won't see me is it I feel like this is the first step towards gentrification like extreme gentrification and they're just trying to make it fancy and fancy equals having facial recognition on my house um, or is it, I fear my data is being, going to be sold, my face is being used for purposes I don't know. Um, yeah, it would be really great to hear more. So it was, it was really interesting. I think, um, just to put it in context, uh, New York City is going through mass gentrification, which really equates to the push out of black communities. And so I think it was much more initially, oh my God, I'm gonna lose my home. And if I lose my home, this is where my family have been, this is where my roots have been, where will I go? And as, we, as they started to um, amass support, that's when we start to add all of these other different elements. So we started out by pointing out that in the New York City gang database, which automatically you can be entered onto it automatically if you are seen in a social media picture with a gang member, if you are seen close to where a gang member lives, if you are wearing gang colors. So what tends to happen is a bunch of people that 
had nothing to do with a gang, but live in Brownsville, had ended up on these systems, and there had already been a movement against and some education around how social media pages were being scraped, how their pictures were being collected. And so it was, very, it was, um, it was really an easy leap to then speak about facial recognition, specifically um, look at some of the reports that had been done about non-recognition of faces and then say, but this is part of what could be not just a dystopian future, but is actually illegal. And not only do you have tenants' rights to stay in your home, but we do know that the NYPD, which is our police force, had been using um, driving lice pictures and selling them to IBM to diversify their data set. So we do have this history of our municipalities collecting faces to then sell on secondary markets. And of course they didn't like that because the streets, you know, garbage isn't being picked up, the schools are crappy. If we're gonna, if we're gonna create all of this new income for the city, it should be for improving those places. Thank you. Um, yeah, and on the question again of this selling particularly black people or minority communities data to secondary sources that we don't know. I had read an article which you had um, somehow, co you had commented on about oh, this, what's it called, one second, um, Promise, the startup Promise, um, and it's to do with uh, tracking people, so it says it's reducing the incarceration rates in the US and black, this is great, especially for black men because they're no longer in prison and Jay-Z had invested um, in this and was like, yeah, this is a really good thing and then that you would fun. come, yeah, you would come back and said, let's think about this more in secondary data and I kind of, in, this is kind of interesting in terms of within minority communities if Jay-Z's at the top and there's people at Brownsville, Brownsville at the bottom, um, how, what are these debates that are being have, had about data and privacy and what's, what's gonna work for us? So I think um, within black communities, it's extremely taboo to critique tech. So I'm often run out of places or shut down in conversations because there is this optimism around um, it has to be good. Like the thing that brought me into this was this idea of Barack Obama being interested in coding. I then found out as I matured that his open source data policies made it easier for the police to surveil black communities. So there was this lack of sophistication that I myself entered into and then because America is a capitalist city, you know, a capitalist country, if Jay-Z can do it and become the first hip hop millionaire, maybe this is a good thing. Whereas my perspective, when it comes to some of those, um, I think it's post bail promises of post bail technology, is people should have the right to freedom. So if they're being tracked, there is something inherently wrong with that. And that, that's the real issue. And then if we are then, because AI will never know how to empathize or contextualize the social context, false associations are gonna end up being made. So if that bracelet notices that you go to this particular place to buy coffee, there is the danger that it's gonna then associate that place with criminality. And then when I show up in the place, that becomes a point against me and I'm hoping that these conversations will continue. Um, one of the things I'm actually doing when I go to Harvard is I'm gonna coordinate the race and AI media group because I wonder whether there's a place for journalists to do some of that work for us and I'm specifically really interested in marrying stories about AI, stories around privacy, stories um, around surveillance with, uh, with popular culture context. So Meek Mill, not very famous rapper, I'm sure here, really not famous in the US, but that's just me, um, recently has, has been speaking about this ridiculously long um, probation that he's on. If I could somehow find out whether that was an algorithmic decision 
then using that story that already, already has this traction to tell this other story about algorithmic decision making that I don't know, I'm, I'm gonna try it out, hopefully it works. There may be a report, I don't know. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, I, yes, I had another question. Uh, yesterday, there seemed to be this debate about the word diversity and diversity of data. Um, and it seems there can be kind of two camps, some that say it doesn't recognize our hands or our faces, so should we create our own data? Do we need to, as people of color or as minority communities, help the training data so that it can be fairer, but at the same time, sometimes it can be quite good to be invisible. We don't want all of us ourselves to be tracked all the time, and sometimes the data can make us invisible in a way that other people are not. And, um, and the idea of invisibility in general seems quite interesting to me in terms of a lot of the things that are happening now happen quietly, these algorithms that we can't see and what do we do? So yeah, just this concept and this debate, I'd wonder what your thoughts are. So I, when I go back, I'm going to a conference called Please Don't Exclude Me, Include Me, sorry, and it's about surveillance and all of these other technologies that I have no interest in impacting, being impacted by. So with the hand washing thing, I'm just like, use soap. Like, do I really need this machine? This is like, you're doing too much. In terms of facial recognition, it's my goddamn face, leave me alone. Like, no, I don't want it used. I think, I really like companies like Wikipedia. I'm somebody who is for the data minimization movement. So take the data that you need to perform the discrete task and then get rid of it. Don't then do what we saw with Cambridge Analytica, which is have me take a test about cats and then use that to how I'm going to vote and then end up with frigging Donald Trump. Like, no, that doesn't work. We're not, I, 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 don't, I don't think so. Do I think, that, do I think that we should have intelligent technologies? Absolutely. Do I think that those intelligent technologies have the potential to change and revolutionize our lives? Absolutely. But if we're also not wondering how those technologies impact our collective freedom, impact our ability to be forgotten. I love that I'm in the EU. I'm like, let me do something and Google put it on so I can tell them to take it off. Because in the US, I don't have that, I don't have that luxury. And I may not want to be remembered from my fourth grade, you know, whatever. Um, I, I, may want to, I may want to change. And I think that one of the most worrying things for me with this hyper data, hyper collection is that you always become a composite of that one moment of time. And it doesn't so much matter for somebody like me, but what if that moment is a moment of criminalization? What if that moment is a moment when my children are taken away? What if that moment, and encapsulating that, I think is really problematic. And I think about this, what if I were trans and I had a moment where I, where, where I, took my, I took my true identity, but all my search is in my prior identity. That, that's a human rights issue. And so, I, I mean, I have a Twitter account. If you follow me, you know I'm super active. Yes, I will be taking a selfie before you ask questions and you will be in it, so you've given permission. Um, but I really don't have anything else because I am so aware of even what I'm doing on Twitter is creating this trail. Yeah, I was um, stalking you on Twitter before and <laughs> I was just scrolling and it was still the same day and I was like, oh, <laughs> a lot to know. Um, but the, yeah, the final question then I'll open it up or, um, is about generations. So I think at, the, at this point we're kind of, you as well are fighting over what gets to be normal and I think I was kind of having a discussion earlier talking to s about some children or some kids and they're like, yeah, facial recognition, obviously that sounds cool, like better than the key. Um, so what's your observations of young people versus the kind of people who are fighting for, for their homes right now and um, how do we use education to 
tackle some of the things you're talking about? So I, I actually have two sons, and what's really interesting is when they got to about eight, they told me not to upload, they told me to shut down my Facebook page because they had been somewhere and somebody had said, oh, I saw you did this. And they felt that that was a huge invasion of their privacy. And when I look at their social media habits, they just want to do that one dance that's a craze and post that. They don't, they're not necessarily interested in leaving these crumbs uh, behind them. So that's very hopeful. And I do, I would love to see in all disciplines critical questioning of, my, my personal issue with facial recognition is that it's the only form of biometric data that does not require my permission. You can literally put a camera in my face and then capture my image, right? And I want to be able to have choice. And in the US context, at least, we do have a constitution that points out what your inalienable rights are. And if, you do, if, if having your, if this passive data collection, which comes from facial recognition, but is also coming, in, coming from listening technologies. So there's this growth of ambient technologies that are collecting conversations. If I'm not giving my explicit permission, that is actually um, impacting one of my inalienable rights. So I would say that it would be a general education about what your human rights are and how they are impacted by these systems. And also demystifying the idea that AI happens in computational spaces, when in reality, AI, the, the, McKinsey did a report and they were saying that AI is gonna add 3.5 to $5.8 trillion to the world economy. And it's gonna be over 19 market segments. So everything from your travel choices to what school you go to, to all the stuff that we know online, to the, there are very offline impacts of these technologies and m most of that business growth is gonna become personalization of data. So that means that they need to have rich data sets about how you're behaving in order to, to, to reap you know, that, that cost. And I think when people start to see AI technologies as everything around them, and not just if you're on social media, that message has to start early. Yeah, I agree, thank you so much. I would love to open it up to the audience if there are questions or comments. So please let us know. Hello, yeah. Uh, thank you for, so much for your insight. Um, I, I wanted to share an observation. Uh, so my impression is really that the discussion he, he, here today, but also yesterday, it's, it's, it's maybe actually a little broader than AI. So it's a lot about technology. You talked about surveillance, about social networks, about um, different types of technologies actually. And um, I was wondering, if so if it if it wouldn't make sense also to to dig dig a little bit deeper into the actual problems of AI so uh, yesterday we had this talk on AI for the common good and uh, I, I think in general what what's behind this is AI for uh, public service delivery basically so in this context actually you, you could argue uh, an automaton so an algorithm uh, which is deterministic um, is is very consistent in a way so it's not uh, taking making exceptions based um, based on on a whim or based on a certain context but given an input it produces a certain output so we know that data is biased and we we have to consider this um, but I, f I feel like Thinking about the implications of AI along these concrete tra uh, trajectories kind of is, is, is maybe a little more constructive because then you, also, you have this issue of what you also pointed out about empathy, right? So you have this determinism and you have empathy and obviously there's a conflict, at least I feel, I feel this way. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious if, 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 yeah, if, if, you, if you have a perspective on 
on, 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 on some of the yeah, con concrete features of automated decision making um, with respect to... Uh, I do. Yeah. So my issues with the data set, it's not, and my issues actually with determ deterministic thinking, because if you have a data set that's biased, all it's doing is reinforcing the bad decisions of the past and then projecting them into the future. So in New York City, we had an, an, an era where the police would stop and frisk people that they thought were dangerous. And when the results came out, it turned out that they were 90% of the black and brown men that they stopped and frisked were completely innocent. They were humiliated in the streets, they were booked, their records were taken, their biometric data was taken, and they had not committed any crime. That same data set is being used to determine who gets bank loans, for instance. So in that determination, you're bringing in what was already inaccurate data. You're bringing in a record of police racism to make a decision about something completely different, right? And so when I think about the development of AI technologies, I'm looking at the design phase for people to have the literacy to say, well, maybe we shouldn't use that data set because this data set has this implications. Maybe we shouldn't try and predict you from, maybe we shouldn't use st statistical models to predict the future at all. Maybe we should use those in conversation with other human decision making, contextual decision making, to make our decisions richer. And I think one of the things that I'm really concerned about in the American public sector, and we see this in um, child determination algorithms is the, st the statistics are going to get it right. We're not even going to allow humans around this decision because the math says. And I, I actually think that that's flawed. And I'm somebody that would advocate for a mixed methods approach to decision making rather than um, relying solely on deterministic algorithms because part of computer science is what you described, this idea of abstraction. But my question to computer scientists is like, how can you abstract social concerns and then deploy within a social world? Only use those technologies for other algorithms. Make them create an algorithmic world and use them all together where it's not gonna have real world impact. Um, and obviously, that doesn't make me popular with computer scientists, and it doesn't um, make me popular with um, VCs, but I'm good with that. I'm really good with that, because what I am concerned about and what I would like to see is a technological future that doesn't use existing biases and existing um, power systems of disenchantment to oppress me even more further than I am oppressed. Any more questions? Okay. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was just wondering, you had said that you um, are a policy advisor um, and I would like to uh, hear more about like some policies that you have specifically advised on and also like how they address AI's link between um, policing and like access to life resources. So um, I haven't actually done work within criminal justice specifically, but I was an advisor on the Algorithmic Accountability Act that was entered in April. And what that really looks for is risk assessments around algorithms and the potential of creating, um, we would call it in the States, FDAs. So be before drugs go into the market, they're tested, they're made sure that they're gonna be safe uh, for the population. So really looking at entering that into the conversation and really problematizing this idea that the algorithm always has it right or it isn't the job of the algorithm to think about the American people. Uh, the second piece of legislation I advised on is the Deep Fakes Accountability Act. So that was really much more looking specifically at online disinformation and creating some type of tagging systems 
for modified video audio content and really is calling for a nationwide study on disinformation and not necessarily the Russians are coming to get us or the Chinese are coming to get us, and more about the white supremacist threat and how search engines like YouTube are really exacerbating those communities after, in the US, we've had attacks on place, places of worship by white nationalists who, in the press, are seen as lone wolves. But when you actually start to go into their bios, you realize that they've all watched these Facebook pages, or they were radicalized on this way online, so trying to get a handle, but for anybody that knows the politics of the United States, it's very likely that they won't be passed into law because, um, because of the way um, you know, our, our politics is right now, but it's likely that they will pass the House and they will create conversation and they will create awareness. So if and when we can ever get free of our current admin administration, there will be, this will already be ripe and something that we can pass into law. Thank you so much for your talk, Mutal. I really enjoyed it, and it's lovely to see you in person, not just on, on Twitter. So, <laughs> um, so I'm trying to frame a question, and I'm, maybe you can help with that. And so, and, 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 and forgive me for kind of, I'll be a little bit, kind of convoluted with this. Um, so the US is, I mean, has a huge business interest. I found it really interesting, that slide about mm -hmm. AI, okay? And so there's only a point up to which the US government is going to put pressure on Silicon Valley because of its business interests. Right. The biggest markets, I suspect, are actually outside the US, and you should correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think you're probably right. I think okay, so if you, I mean, it could be like fintech, it could be, mm -hmm. I mean, social media aside, there's so many other industries. We just mm -hmm. sort of look at social media because it's, we're all on it. Mm -hmm. And fintech is not such a big thing in places like the US and um, Europe because of data privacy regulations. Mm -hmm. It's huge in Nigeria and Brazil and mm -hmm. India and places like this. So, I mean, that's just one market, one industry application I'm interested in, but there are others. So, and, and there's a narrative among scholars and activists from Brazil, from India, from parts of uh, Africa who are talking about digital business colonialism and trying to, and I haven't, I, I've listened to some of that narrative and I know that some of it kind of makes me, I'm like, no, there's a piece that's missing here. And the thing is, the US has such fantastic scholarship on race, mm -hmm. and like really great critical theory on this stuff. There's a lot of activism, there's a lot of fantastic work that's happening. And how does that make, how does that translate into a bigger global conversation that sometimes gets, yeah, it just kind of like doesn't become part of that picture. I mean, and I know that we don't have enough scholarship from a lot of other parts of the world and there's not enough money going into it and mm -hmm. the law, the institutions, these are all kind of part of it. So I'm not doing a very good job of well, this is the thing. I like. I don't know how to frame the question, but I think this. That's fair. Yeah. No, I think it's Thanks. a big. Qu I think it's a big question. I actually kind of think of. I understand. So I'm going to reframe just to make sure that I'm answering the right question. So I'm thinking about the interconnectedness of the the work that I'm doing specifically, mainly because what happens in the U.S. policy-wise is then often tried to be cut and paste into different contexts, so there's that piece. But then this other piece, I think, around racial literacy, there is always the assumption that just because people in Brazil, India, and Africa are black and brown, that we all agree and we've, we've, we've all shared power, and, and that's not necessarily true either. And I think one of the things that I'm really beginning to think about is that question specifically. So in the racial literacy and technology paper, um, Jesse Daniels is the lead author. She also has a 25 year career writing about online white supremacy and five books to her name. And me writing with her was a huge 
um, validation of me and my work. And I'm wondering specifically as I'm moving to Harvard, whether I can find scholars from the global south and we can co-author and we can publish through Harvard University because I know that their insights around technological markets in the global south are not just gonna inform my work, but hopefully make me more thoughtful when I'm thinking about policy for the US context because I specifically work in the US context. I'm specifically interested in the US as it becomes a minority majority country. And my, my prediction is that it will be like South Africa in the sense that there may be demographically more white people, but I mean, I'm sorry, less white people, but the power and the ability to pull the levers of society are gonna stay in their hands and then there will be this majority of people that are relatively disadvantaged and so nothing will really change um, in terms of how we do business, um, as it were. And that's the conversation that I'm having ongoing. I think also knowing that the primary goal is to support business means that I'm extremely careful about how I speak about these issues depending on which room I'm in. So if I'm in a room that I don't believe is gonna be sympathetic, I speak about national security exposures and I refer to the Mueller report and the evidence that we already have around how racial bias has been weaponized against white people. If I'm thinking about something with facial recognition, I wouldn't put up that slide, right? I would look for some other example where some white woman from the Midwest, something terrible, oh my God, look what they're doing to the white people. This is terrible, we should help them. And then um, that's the way to push through because there has to be a way for me to be pragmatic enough to say, yes, let's all go and get this money, but let's do it in a way that doesn't completely obliterate, destroy, and disadvantage whole swaths of the population, because that's not who we are. And I think one of the things that I really struggle with right now is that I don't feel that we have the moral leadership from the White House to even set that tone, right? I'm extremely critical of Obama's um, approach to technology and data policies, but I did also, on the other hand, feel that if it, I, I felt that he believed in America that, was the, the, that had certain values that, and those, same, th those values don't align with this administration. And, and having that kind of buy-in and that narrative being driven from the top is extremely helpful when you're speaking to public sector decision makers because they're ultimately, whether we like it or not, we're going to look at the highest office in the land to provide us with strategic direction. I know that was a non-answer, um, and it was a long non-answer, but it was, it, but it's also kind of where I'm at, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm grappling, you know, I'm really grappling with that. Uh, I was wondering if there's enough data in your example of South Africa about the positive changes in society that we could use and adapt it to current um, problematic issues. Namely, I was just curious if you, um, if you have enough um, individual stories, for example. In right. Um, I don't know that I was using South Africa positively. Um, I guess is the first thing. I have a lot of critiques around um, the way that country is unfolding. Um, I don't have that data. It's, it's my assumption though that even if, so popula the, the population flip, as it were, has been driven by the, La the Latinx community because in every other population segment in the US, people are having less children, but that's not true in the Latinx community. So Latinx populations will be our most, uh, our biggest segment. And then um, probably, I don't even know what would be next, but black and white would actually be pretty similar because we're reproducing at similar rates. 
but the point would be because white people are having less children and you have this other population segment having more children that collectively this population will flip. And that's a lot of why we're hearing all of this border talk, the wall, the Mexicans, the, that's why that population segment are being um, impacted. My assumption, and this is not based on fact, is that those same groups are gonna face the same ingrained social, um, economic challenges that they faced historically, so they're not gonna have power. I don't know that that's optimistic. But any other example where larger scale? Um, no, I haven't done those changes. studies. It's just an, it's, it's, an, it's what I know of South Africa, but I, I, uh, I mean, white people do really well in the world. I just, I, I can't even think of one country where they've got it close to right, so I don't know. No. Because the example you've had with um, the police, st police statistics was, um, was apparently accurate with... Um, yeah, because I know that. I don't know about... I think I'm be trying very politely to say I have no idea. Me? Or, yeah. <laughs> I think it's you. Okay, so I do this question then. Um, yeah, no, I wanted to ask you something related again to policy literacy because uh, we were also having this conversation about the fact uh, that uh, the people in Congress uh, didn't. Uh, uh, were not really able to ask the right question the, to Zuckerberg during the Facebook hearing. <laughs> so um, I think this is an important point because you are also in between, like a mediator between the civil society and the people mm -hmm. that are in politics. So what do you think uh, is possible to use as a strategy? Because of course from the civil society come the right question but then we have, of course, uh, the people in politics that should be able to execute them. So what would be your advice in this term? Also, maybe the strategy you are applying and uh, your advice also for us uh, that we could do the same here in Germany, you know? I think you first, there needs to be, and this is something I'm actually going to be involved in at Harvard as well, there needs to be an ethnographic study to find out how policymakers learn about the impacts of AI technologies on society, both from, both from a technical aspect, so we want them to sit with computer scientists to really grapple with and understand how these technologies are built, but then also understand their deployment. And I think once we know how they're built, we can then create pedagogical, effective pedagogical models. Because I think what's happening right now, at least in Washington, are many of the tech lobbyists are just people that used to work in the offices. They don't know anything about technology, they don't know anything about technology in society, but they know the person that they're speaking to. Because the currency in Washington is trust, and people only trust people from their in-group. and. I would like personally to know how to disrupt that and to really bring them into conversation with people like, like the people in this room, people from civil society who are studying these issues, computer scientists who can break down um, how the systems are made. And then you actually need to be in conversation with legal scholars, because then you need to figure out, do we already have existing frameworks that can address this problem? Or in the case of civil rights that I brought up during the talk, do we need to create new frameworks? And I, the work I've done with Clark over the last three years, I think has been a real pilot. I was very fortunate. I've actually known the Congresswoman for over 10 years. We've done numerous different other projects together. And it just so happened that my expertise were in this area, so she brought me in. But I may not have been brought in other than that. And that just seems a bit too happenstance. And then it took us, so just to give you an idea, the Algorithmic Accountability Act took about a year of coaching, briefing, 
private meetings, meetings with technologists, meetings with social scientists, meetings with people from the humanities, meetings with legal scholars, so that when that act was brought to us, because it was actually Cory Booker, who's a presidential candidate, who brought the act to the office, she then felt empowered with what to do. The same with the Deep Fakes Act. So in ways of advice, I would advise that civil society, these are long-term projects, and you're gonna spend most of that time building trust. And because we're not lobbyists, right? I'm an advisor, I'm not a lobbyist. I, my only, um, the only thing that I want to do is to safeguard the common good. Many of the other people that come in front of them have these other motives that they themselves are suspicious of. So um, one of the things, uh, uh, I'm doing so much when I, I hope I can do all of these things I've told you I'm gonna do when I'm at Harvard, oh my God. But having them come up during recess and sit with my colleagues at Harvard Law School, that's where I'm gonna be based, and look at legal frameworks, as well as my colleagues at MIT to look at civic tech frameworks, and hope that by the end of that particular um, year that we would have built these, we would have built a model and have some at least qualitative evidence for how they learn and then adapt models around that. Hi, uh, thanks for your great talk. Um, basically, I just want to say uh, that uh, you mentioned this aspect of the discomfort of uh, people working in tech when it comes to uh, uh, the subject of colonialism or race mm -hmm. or whatever uh, that basically uh, touched something inside of me that um, because it really sets me up I'm a developer myself mm -hmm. and in our team uh, there was once the debate about setting up a testing environment and uh, all of my colleagues were really keen to use an IO domain because it's very hip mm -hmm. a lot of startups are using it but actually it means Indian Ocean which is a regional domain but none of the countries that are there profit from it. Yeah? It's yeah. basically a colonial domain. Mm -hmm. And I was just mentioning it just to make sure we are all having the same information. And they were telling me, oh man, what are you doing? Don't bring politics in here. And it really yeah. set me up because it's, it's not me that brings in the politics in this uh, thing. Mm -hmm. And also because it was mentioned yesterday from Charlotte Webb, uh, the circumstances of how AI is also managed and developed is not in a in a laboratory, yeah? mm -hmm. the, everyone who has seen the movie The Cleaners knows that there is so many, like Cleaners. so much colonialism mm -hmm. actually being uh, utilized to manage AI mm -hmm. and ethics. Yeah? They mm -hmm. execute ethical terms of service mm -hmm. um, by the work they do. Yeah? It's incredible not to think about that. No. And also it's not safe. Like that example you gave, one of the things that we found, so the racial literacy framework actually comes from education. And the scholar whose work we adapted speaks about that moment of stress. And where, um, and I, I, I would say stress for white people, I would modify that because I, I don't really feel it. But that moment of stress where it's like, oh my God, we're talking about race, oh, that it has to be better, we're, we're not. And, I think if we could just figure out how to deploy a, a general literacy, it would stop that lone person in the team saying, this is kind of bullshit, like, no, nah, we're not gonna do this. And then everybody jump on them and then they get really mad. I've been like, you should come visit me in New York. There's so many places we can't go because I've made the people mad because they don't want to talk about race. And I'm like, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't know. It's not good. It's not being a good human. Um, so I, I, I'm probably the only policymaker here in the room. I suspect Hi. maybe we yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fellow policymaker. So coming from, I've only recently moved into working for the government, and so what strikes me there, and and that's kind of links to what you said about um, the data, like policies of of like using my data for this particular thing and mm -hmm. then dropping it, um, but what you see is that proposals are based on, policy proposals are based on the past, are based on mm -hmm. predictions. They, they, they like first make the base part, as they say, 
and then they see what policy proposals would change according to that. That's, that's how you kind of create really concrete interventions. And now suddenly, while using AI to do that, you see that this is like this base part, it's kind of, we see that hard codified and it kind of grows exponentially. That's why we suddenly discuss it. But it's always been done, as you pointed out, with different statistical models that are always modeled on what is now and are always ingrained in the, in the current power structures. And so what you're suggesting um, is um, that we really have to change these power dynamics mm -hmm. to even start to, to have any type of change that uh, questions this. And then I wonder, so can we look at different data or kind of, can we then put in these systems different policy proposals altogether, different ways of making policies based on different views, different frameworks, different uh, data sets, like kind of create alternatives to, to question such interventions altogether? I think we can, I don't know how. There is a lot of scholarship coming out of the AI ethics space that's looking at like indigenous models and other models to use. And so I myself are beginning to be curious. I don't know, I'm kind of at the beginning of the journey. The issue, you really spoke to the issue well, where if the base data is wrong, right? And many of our policies in the US are disastrous for black communities. And this is even outside of AI. If we, if we look at the way our crime policies work, I'm, I'm writing something right now about the Clintons and the 1994 crime bill, which wasn't an AI bill, actually criminalized the use of cocaine, as, of crack differently to the use of powder cocaine, even though it was the same drug. And even though they didn't base it on the fact that black people used one form of cocaine and white people used the other, it did have this racialized impact, right? So that practice of using the past to predict the future, if that past is, a, a white sup is built on the notion of white supremacy, what I'm arguing for is let's name that, let's talk about race, let's be literate about that, so that there are people in the room, um, like the gentleman over here with the domain, there are people, and it's not just him who they're making fun of, but there are people in the room that can say, it's gonna have this impact. I know in DC, my target population are the Congressional Black Caucus, and you would expect them to be really comfortable to talk about race, but they're not. And the reason that they're not is that they do not want to incite white fragility. Because once white people get upset about talking about race and then they want you to make them feel better and then it becomes something else and then you're kind of their therapist and then that's not what we were going for. It kind of derails the whole situation. And my... Um, best advice would be that we start to have a very systematic conversation about engaging our utopian, our joint utopian imagination and setting up structures that serves that. So my concern may be race, but I actually have many concerns. I want to see justice and I want everybody to see justice. And guess what? That means that we may not have a thousand billionaires they may have to pay taxes to get to that justice. They may have to have companies broken up to get to that justice. Jeff Bezos cannot give us everything, you know? Um, and that's a really controversial thing to say in the American context. But that doesn't mean I'm not gonna say it. Okay, and I think on that note, um, we've run out of time, unfortunately, so if you could all join me in uh, thanking Natale for coming. <laughs>
so much for Rosanna and for Rihanna. Uh, this was really a great uh, way to go on uh, into the discussion of uh, the social consequence of AI. And also I hope people in the future will follow your work because you are doing something very important. And so I also have to say that usually we have the policy not to photograph the face of the people in this room, but we did a big exception for you <laughs> and your selfie. So yes. <laughs> Um, and so now I would say that uh, we have uh, 15 minutes break and then we go on with uh, the panel uh, about uh, AI and politics uh, and uh, so uh, and I anti-fascism and all these great concepts. So I think, uh, yeah, just let's have a break of 15 minutes and see you soon. Thank you.